You may have heard um, that I'm doing some research on Unitarian Universalist theology and adoption of children. I'm actually wrapping up that project, finally. Over the years, I conducted a bunch of interviews with other ministers who were either adoptees, adoptive parents, or birth parents. It wasn't until really the end of all of this that I realized that I had ignored a really important piece of the project. Throughout the planning and the research and the writing, the word story kept coming up. It was actually the very first question I asked in those interviews. What's your story? What's your point of connection with adoption? Eventually, before I completed the research project, I realized that story isn't just incidental. Story and the power of story is really an important piece of the project. Often in interviews, these stories of adoption functioned a lot like coming out stories for people who are LGBT or call stories, those experience of, of, for ministers, how they get called into this profession. These stories encapsulate a piece of the past that really helps explain present day life. Even when the stories unfold differently, sharing the common experience of adoption creates a sense of bonding. The same could be true of coming out stories or ministerial call stories. And part of that bond emerges because those stories aren't just one distinct moment of the past. They're tales of a much longer unfolding process. In the journey of adoption, there's an initial sex act, there's nine months of pregnancy, there's a birth experience, there's the adoption experience, there's relationships between birth parents and adoptive parents, a whole series of disclosures. For adoptive parents, the earliest phases of that journey are a little different, but still there's this long unfolding. As relationships grow and change and discoveries are made, Throughout a lifetime, the story continues to unfold up until the present moment, the moment that two people are talking together. For this research, I decided to dig a little deeper into the importance of story. I found that some people have said that narrative or story is the thing that defines human consciousness. The easiest way to see how this works is to look at the way we experience time passing from past, present, into the future. We don't often think about it, but memory is a necessary piece of how we experience the present moment. Without any memory, the world would be an overwhelming mess of nonsense. We wouldn't know who we were or what was going on. We rely on memory to make sense of the present. And that has within it a sense of before and after. The present moment is this constant moving point dividing a known past from an unknown future. The present is a moment of tension, holding on to a past and anticipating something that might happen in the future. And this holding together of two different times, a past and a future, this mediating between a known and an unknown is kind of the way story works. Narrative or story is maybe the best way of describing that human experience of sitting with what we know and anticipating a future. I know that's a little abstract. My apologies, but the point is, story is really, really, really important. More than entertainment, story is what shapes our perspective and defines us a lot of times. <clears throat> you are all storytellers, whether you know it or not. You compose, edit, tell, and retell the story of your life all the time. Your mind plays a running narrative and video about 
who you are and the events of life unfolding scene after scene leading up to this very moment. And each of us has a unique combination of joys and accomplishments, losses, moments of grace. For many people, experiences of trauma color the story. One moment or phase of life can shade all the rest with echoes of fear or pain. One moment or one phase can make us doubt our self-worth. The really amazing thing about stories, though, is that they can be told in different ways. Some of the best pieces of literature and film play with that idea. They tell the same story from different perspectives of different characters, right? A story is a lot more than a pile of facts. A story includes interpretation about why things happened and who was responsible. The facts of what actually physically happened are a small part. And everything else can be rewritten in a multitude of different ways. So after we leave here, when you have a little bit of time, I encourage you to think of some of the pieces of your story that make you stronger, make you a better person. You might wrap yourself in those stories for a moment like a blanket. And also, when you have time, consider which pieces of your story make you feel fragile or afraid. And remember, you are the writer, perhaps the editor. Your story is yours to remember and to retell. You are the one that gets to reinterpret and make meaning out of those events. No one else, from even before you were born up to this very moment, other than the physical details of what actually happened everything else can be reinterpreted. Don't let anyone from your past, don't let anyone tell your story for you. Of course, stories are more than our individual lives. We live in a great big web of shared stories. These days, it can actually be pretty overwhelming. Swimming in too much information seems a little bit like the curse of the 21st century. In the past few years, we've become more aware of monitoring the type and the amount of news that we listen to. I know a lot of tapestry members have gotten disciplined about their news diet. We're paying a lot more attention now to the power that rests in the hands of storytellers. In many ways, this is what that whole controversy of critical race theory is about. The disagreement isn't so much about the material facts of what happened. The disagreement is about interpretation of those facts. Why did it happen? Who was responsible? How should we interpret those centuries of pattern to understand our world today? So this weekend, as we remember the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, I'm reminded of the challenge of interpreting our past in a way that drives us towards some hope and some action. His legacy, his story was really complicated. As we heard from Kid President, things were not always awesome. Reflecting on Dr. King, Dr. King and his legacy could lead us to great optimism or to great despair. Despair seems to be very fashionable these days. Sometimes I hear people land there when bad things happen, and I usually come up with a common response. Okay. If people are terrible, 
the system is broken and there's no hope, I guess we just pack it up and go home. That's the only logical next step, right? To go home and pop some popcorn and watch the world implode on TV? That doesn't seem like a very viable option. Utter despair is not where we belong, and it certainly isn't in keeping with our faith tradition. But Dr. King also warned us against the opposite of despair. He warned us about blind optimism and the danger there. I still have the copy of King's letter from a Birmingham jail that we read in my high school English class. It's a sad, yellowed paperback copy, not quite falling apart, but almost. King's warning about blind optimism is the passage from that whole essay that sticks with me the most. He was writing to white clergymen in his day, so I guess I should pay attention. He warned that for too long, good people assumed that there was something inherently positive about the passage of time. They assumed that progress was inevitable. He wrote, quote, Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of people willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. There's nothing inherently positive about the passage of time. We might remember that optimism is as dangerous as despair. Both ultimately lead to shirking our responsibility to build a world that we dream about. One, because progress seems impossible, and the other, because it seems inevitable. Charting a course, co course of hope between those two deadly points requires attention to how we remember and celebrate a legacy. And it's not just the legacy of Dr. King, but a legacy of countless generations of men, women, and binary, uh, non-binary people who have resisted oppression. They didn't win every time. More often than not, they were beat down, imprisoned, or even killed, but incrementally, step by step, they've made progress. We have made progress. You have been part of that progress in different ways. Most visibly in this community, that progress has come for women and lesbian and gay people. It's wider than that, too. It's been slow and hard won, but because of work and sacrifice, a lot has gotten better. As we each look for renewal in our own way, I think it's vitally important that we calibrate our expectations. In our beautifully imperfect world, let us remember that renewal can't depend on a perfect moment or a promise of paradise. I would even warn us away from setting our sights on the best. How about just orienting ourselves and our sense of renewal toward good. Not perfect, not best, just good. Some good news. Some forward progress in the world. Every day we have an opportunity to do a little good for ourselves and others. Every day we have opportunities to grow in our courage as we side with love and speak out against bigotry wherever we see it. <clears throat> I know Dr. King was most famous perhaps for a speech he delivered about a big, bold dream. But I guarantee you, he wouldn't have gotten as far as he did on that journey without piecing together much smaller glimmers of hope along the way. 
little pieces of good stuck together with scotch tape and a prayer can add up into something really great. So as we remember Dr. King's journey and his story, we acknowledge the struggle and the hard-won progress. As the story continues to unfold to this day, we take our place in it, building a better world wherever the opportunities arise. This year for Christmas, I gave my niece and nephew a couple of books. I've done this in the past, but it's getting fun because they're reading chapter books now. I remember my mom reading us one of these books on a road trip back in the day. And I remember in school on hot days after recess, we would come back into the classroom and have some time of the teacher reading to us. There was something so nice about spending time together that way. Story time can be a good opportunity to escape. It can be time to learn about different worlds or to connect more deeply with our emotions. Spending time with the right book can be a tremendous source of rest and renewal. So I guess I want to invite us into some intentional story time this week. These aren't the stories in books or on television. These are the stories that you hold in your heart and your mind. Stories about progress, stories about how far we have come and where we might go. What are some of the stories of your own life that make you stronger and better? Treasure them. Enjoy them for all they are worth. Also, I hope you'll consider which pieces of your story, the story that you tell about yourself, make you feel fragile or afraid. I bet if you poke around just a little bit, there's another version, another interpretation, a story that led you to getting through and being here today. We need to hear and we need to write stories of hope. Whether those are the stories of our own life or long unfolding stories of the struggle for justice. The way we write and tell those stories builds the world we live in. Amen.